Okay, great. Yeah. So, so we're extremely happy today to have uh, Peter Abnati uh, from uh, UIUC to talk about his uh, brand new discovery in, in Pines. Uh, what do you call that? Demon? Or, or it's a <laughs> demon. demon. I think demon. it's a demon. <laughs> demon. Demon in Strongson Rusnet 04. I mean, I, I was trying to get Peter to talk about the charge ordering, but he, 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 did, he told me this is much more exciting. So, uh, and uh, he gives some of the slides to. Uh, yeah, the, to to uh, <clears throat> to to JP. So so JP talked a little bit about that, but uh, yeah, we're very happy to have you. Yes, thank you. Okay, so I should I just start? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay, thanks everybody for zooming in. Um, so I'm going to talk about a new result on this uh, material strontium ruthenate. It's an unconventional superconductor with a pairing symmetry that I think we all agree we no longer know. Uh, I'm going to talk about the normal state, the collective excitations. Um, at, at higher temperatures. So um, strontium ruthenate is a pretty interesting material. It, at uh, temperatures below about 100 Kelvin, it's a nice Fermi liquid, has T squared resistivity. At high temperature, high energy scales, it crosses over into something that's much more uh, exotic. It has sort of T linear resistivity, the quasi particles disappear and eventually becomes a bad metal where the resistivity crosses the mott yaffe rego limit. So it's an interesting system in that it's kind of simple at low energies and, and weird at high energies. So it's an, you can sort of study the transition between the two. Um, so we've uh, discovered a new collective excitation in this material. It's a thing that was predicted by David Pines in 1956. He called it a demon. I don't know if that's the right pronunciation. Well, I'll, I'll show you this slide from his, the words from his paper where he names this thing and we can have a debate over the right naming convention. Um, so what I'm gonna, so what I'm gonna do is, uh, so, and this is an hour talk, right? Yeah, 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 some yeah, things. yeah. So I'm gonna make it a little bit pedagogic. I'm gonna spend the first time, first few slides just talking about screening and metals and uh, what makes a metal different from an insulator then and, and how screening manifests in the collective excitations of a metal, which is an object, a thing called a plasmon. And then I'll talk about what demons are and how that's related to screening and multi-component metals. And uh, then we'll get into the experiments. And I should point out that we didn't, of course, go seeking this excitation. We found this thing by accident. We actually saw it originally. Um, experiments were done by my student, Ali Hussein, who's now at UBC. Let me get my pointer going here. Uh, laser pointer, arrow. No, I don't know. Actually, can you see my my arrow if I move it around? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are experiments by my former student Ali Hussein, and uh, who's now at UBC. And I'm going to show you theory calculations RPA from a postdoc named Edwin Huang. Anyway, we saw this excitation back in 2018. It took a while to figure out what it is, and it turned out to be this demon mode. So, um, so I'm going to start from the very beginning um, and uh, just talk about the basics of, of screening and metals and what that has to do with, with um, its collective modes. Okay, so the fundamental property of a metal, if you talk to a theorist, is that it is compressible. So the compressibility of a system is basically a description of how its volume changes under application of pressure. So this is a way of defining the compressibility at fixed particle number. And um, uh, a metal is an object that's compressible because it has low energy excitation, so you can change its density. Whereas an insulator is an incompressible object. It's just uh, one way of defining the difference between those two things. So um, the compressibility of a system has implications for the way it screens. So there's a thing called the compressibility sum rule, which says that the real part of the polarizability of a system is, is given by its compressibility. And uh, for a metal, this is a constant. And for an insulator in three dimensions, and I think actually also in two dimensions, uh, the, this polarizability goes to zero as Q squared. So um, this is just a sum rule. It simply implies that whenever there, if the way a system responds to pressure is related to the way it responds to um, external fields and densities and so on. Okay, so what does this have to do with screening? So the dielectric function of a material is related to this polarizability by one minus V pi. So V is just the Coulomb interaction, E squared over Q squared. And if you simply take these two traits and ask what, that, what does that mean for epsilon, it means that in an insulator in the limit of small Q, 
epsilon is a constant. So that's called dielectric screening. It says that an, an insulator will reduce the electric fields by some finite proportionality constant in principle. Whereas in a metal, epsilon diverges like one over Q squared. So the dielectric screening of a metal is actually infinite in the long wavelength limit at zero frequency. So in practice, what that means is that in metals, um, electric fields are screened completely. So if I take a hunk of a metal, which I'm gonna define as a compressible object and put it in between uh, plates of a capacitor and then put a voltage on there so there's some free charge on the capacitor, if you just do Gauss's law, then uh, the metal will acquire some bound charge on the surface, which is epsilon minus one over epsilon uh, times free charge. And in the case of a dielectric, epsilon is just some number. So you just get some E field inside the material. If epsilon is infinity, which it is in a, in a metal, then sigma B is sigma F and the E field is inside. So if an object is compressible, it implies that electric fields can't live inside it. Um, it necessarily screens charge completely. Okay, so what does this have to do with collective excitations? Um, if you have a system that screens, it implies the existence of a collective mode. So another way to view the screening of a system is in terms of its density response, uh, which is usually written chi of Q and omega. So this quantity describes how a system responds when you put some external charge in it. So suppose the blue, the blue dots represent electrons in a metal and the red is some impurity that you put in, then uh, this uh, response function will tell you what the induced charge is due to that externally applied charge. So rho induced is V chi rho external in linear response. So the polar, so the screening properties of a material are also embedded in this quantity that tells you how excitations propagate in the system. So um, V chi is related to epsilon, one over, as one over epsilon minus one. And that means that in the limit of zero frequency, as Q goes to zero, V chi goes to minus one, which is an, because epsilon goes to infinity, which implies that chi goes to zero like Q squared. So now I'm just gonna say some things that are true and hope that it makes things clear. If it makes things more confusing and not less, then please ask a question. Zoom talks are really hard because I can't tell if anybody's listening to me or not. I'm talking to a bookshelf. So don't, people, people are, hesitate, people are <laughs> don't hesitate to unmute and ask. Anyway, so this so so chi in three dimensions typically goes like um, goes to zero like q squared. So this product is a is just a number, and that's tied to the fact that chi satisfies what's called the f sum rule. So if you take the imaginary part of chi, and take its first moment and integrate, it's always just given by some by the electron total electron density, and this thing and there's a q squared here because this chi goes to zero like q squared. Okay, so what does this have to do with collective modes? If you for a typical metal, if you plot this chi double prime of Q and omega, it exhibits a peak. This peak sits at some frequency and um, this thing is called a plasma. All metals have them. They may be broad, they may be sharp. Um, I think it's a sort of underserved topic, the properties of these things, and we're getting more involved in this. But um, generically in a simple metal, chi has a peak, it's a plasma. And the plasma in a sense is the, is the excitation that generates all the screening properties. So you can think of this screening of a charge due to charges moving around as the system generating virtual plasmons. And uh, it's a, just a, the fundamental collective mode of a metal. One of the important features of a plasmon is it must satisfy this F sum rule. So if you measure this thing by measuring chi double prime, and I'm gonna show you measurements of it in a few minutes, the integrated intensity of this thing will always scale as Q squared. So this thing will go to zero in the limit of small momentum in any measurement of chi double prime. And that's tied to the F sum rule and the compressibility sum rule and the fact that a metal is a thing that screens charge. Okay, so that's my summary of, of basic metals. So, um, so let's talk about David Pine's um, paper. So in 1956, so Pine's early work was all on many body phenomena. He was sort of the pioneer who mapped out um, the concept of collective modes and screening and metals and quasi-particles and so on. And um, there was this paper in the Canadian Journal of Physics in 1956, where he considered what would happen if you had a metal with two species of electrons. So uh, this is quite general. The conclusions from this are quite general, but you can think of this as, say, a material with two different Fermi surfaces. With, so there's two different flavors of electrons in the system. 
And so what he did is he said, okay, let's suppose instead of one kind of electron, I have two. And let's just for the sake of argument, assume one set of them are very light and the other set are very heavy. So that either one taken in independently <coughs> has a plasma frequency and the light ones have a plasma frequency that's really high compared to the heavy ones. So, um, or if you equivalently, you could say the Fermi velocity of one set is much less than the Fermi velocity of the, of the other set of particles. So what he did is he did a bunch of physical arguments and some math. And what he argued is that this system should actually have two plasmons, which is sensible because there's two subsets of carriers. It should have what he called an optical plasmon, which is a sort of the, I guess you could call it the geometric sum of the two plasma frequencies. So that would be one where the two sets of carriers just oscillate together in unison. And then there would be another mode that's actually gapless. And he argued this thing would have a, a, a dispersion relation that's linear in Q. And what this is, is a, is a neutral excitation. And there are different, several different ways you can think about what this is. One is it's an out of phase plasmon. Um, so that would be where the, instead of the two sub baths of carriers moving together, one moves one way and the other moves the other way so that they are out of phase. Um, another way to think about it is it's an excitation of, of neutral particles. So if you have a, a metal and you put in one charge, that charge gets screened completely. So meaning the resulting thing, once it's been screened, is a neutral particle. So what he imagined is, what, is that the light electrons, the things in red, would completely screen the heavy electrons. And then what you'd get would be a collective mode of neutral particles. And the collective mode of neutral fermions is... Is, um, a, is a gapless mode. So that would be like the sound wave in helium three or something like that. So this thing should have linear dispersion. It has, and it has a velocity that he argued in this particular case should lie in between the two individual Fermi velocities of the two bands. So as a purely theoretical paper, it wasn't incredibly rigorous. It was more physically arguing that such an excitation should exist. And then he named it. So uh, just copied out of the, paper, here's what he wrote. I've always thought it too bad that Maxwell lived too early to have a particle or excitation named in his honor. Therefore, I suggest that in honor of Maxwell and because we deal here with the case of distinct electron motion, DEM, meaning these two sets of carriers moving apart, moving in opposite directions, we call these new excitations demons. So this has nothing to do with Maxwell's demon in thermodynamics. I think he just liked the name. I'll be completely honest. It's, I'm not thrilled with the name. I would have named it something different, but Pines has passed and out of respect, I think we have to um, go with his convention. And Peng Cheng, you said, how is this thing pronounced? I'll be honest, this is all I have. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I, that, that how I would pronounce it as well. <laughs> yeah. Demon, demon, anyway, yeah. O-N is like a particle, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think we just have to go with this. Can I, can I ask, is there any assumption made about uh, how the heavy and the light electrons would interact or not interact in this? He assumes they just interact by Coulomb. If that's, if that's uh, there's really not much more to it than that. So, so does it matter? I mean, you have two sets of electrons. Basically, do they have to be... Uh, a whole band or electron band? I mean, this is a sort of, you talk it, about- it, should, it shouldn't matter. Okay. But I'll be honest with you. So he, he what the, his paper says in this particular limit, a demon should exist. One thing the paper doesn't do is lay out rigorous criteria for the circumstances under which demons exist and when they don't. So mm -hmm. I don't think I know completely when you would always, when you would in general expect to have one. Okay. Um, I've, I can regurgitate some intriguing ideas that I've heard from Piers Coleman and others that demons may actually be required to exist because of gauge invariance. Mm. Let me save that to the end. Okay. Um, but, okay, so good. So let's, so, so one of the key features, so what are the key features of a demon if you were to measure one? One is that it's gapless and that's not easy to do, to take a, plasmon-like excitation in three dimensions and make it gapless, that's not easy, right? Because if I move charged particles in three dimensions, I always have to overcome some Coulomb energy to do that. That's why plasmons sit at such, at such high frequency in normal metals, copper, aluminum, they're at tens of electron volts. 
to, to have a collective mode made of electrons where you displace the dynamical coordinate and there's no Coulomb cost to doing that. That's a very difficult thing to do in three dimensions. Two dimensions, it's easy. 2D plasmons are gapless. Even conventional plasmons are gapless in two dimensions. But doing that in 3D is difficult. So one feature is that they're gapless. The other feature is that the modes are neutral. And this is where I want to spend a couple of minutes since I get a whole hour for this and define exactly what neutral means. So um, if you think about what a, what a demon is, it's a, it's a case where I'm taking two sets of carriers and I move them opposite one another. So the dynamical coordinate is one where the two baths move in opposite directions. So unlike a plasmon, where moving the, whole, the dynamical coordinate builds up charge on one face of the material and depletes it from the other one. In the case of a demon, if I displace the coordinate, I don't build up any charge on either face because the two currents uh, cancel one another. So there's no buildup of charge on the, on, the, on the boundaries, meaning there's no Coulomb cost to making this thing, which is why it's gapless. But the consequence of that is if I take a, a hunk of, let's suppose I had a material and it just had a demon in it. It didn't have a plasma. That material would not be able to screen. Okay, so if I took a demon and I put it inside some uh, a capacitor and I put plates on the two uh, plates of the capacitors, this demon would not be able to um, to generate an E field that counteracts the one from the from the capacitor. Because if I move electrons from one band in one direction, electrons from the other band would go in the opposite direction. I don't have any way of building up bound charge on the surface. So said another way, if a, de if a, material, if a demon were the only excitation in a material, the dielectric function and the limit of long wavelength limit would be one. Okay, so, so when I say that a demon is neutral and when David Pine said that, this is really the rigorous definition. It doesn't contribute to the dielectric function in the long wavelength limit. So now the excitation was predicted in 1966. It wasn't seen until now. If you ask why not, this is the main reason. They don't couple to light. They're really neutral modes. So there's a conversation to be had about how you would even measure that thing. So that's why I'm gonna get into eels. At any rate, so if V pi, so if this thing goes to one, it means that V pi goes to zero in the long wavelength limit. In the case of a metal, um, that thing actually goes to, a, goes to minus one. Um, that uh, scratch that. At any rate, um, uh, for this thing to go to one, it means that pi has to go to zero and has to go to zero faster than q squared. So that has to go like q to the two plus alpha, where alpha is greater than one. The consequence of that is chi, which is what one would measure in an experiment. Um, it goes like q to the two plus alpha, where alpha is some number greater than one. And the consequence of that is that if you assume that the demon has linear dispersion, its integrated intensity should not go like Q squared, which is what a normal plasmon would do. It has to go to Q to the three plus alpha. So I bring this up. It's a little bit of an esoteric point, but it means that demons cannot satisfy the F sum rule. Okay. Um, a, 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 a demon, there's no partial sum rule that could ever apply to a demon excitation, which is another way of saying a demon can never exist on its own. It always has to be living in conjunction with some high energy plasma that eats the long range part of the Coulomb interaction. So, um, okay, I'm so getting off on a tangent a little bit, but. So, so it stems from the gamma point. Say that again? It, it always stems from a gamma point, I mean, from, from Q equal to zero, uh, uh, repeat Yes, itself. yes, that's right. And that, that's crucial because, there, yes, it's truly acoustic. It's, it's at zero at the gamma point. Okay. Actually, this is an important point because there's a lot of papers in nature recently seeing acoustic plasmons with RICs. But I don't know if anybody's followed any of that stuff. But if you haven't, then I won't address it. <laughs> but those excitations are not actually acoustic because they go to the plasma frequency at Q equals zero. This thing really goes to zero at Q equals zero. The acoustic mode cannot be finite at Q equals zero, yeah. Yeah, right. If it goes to zero at some finite Q, that's very interesting, but it's, that, does, that's not, that doesn't mean it's acoustic. That could happen okay. even in charge system. Okay. Okay, anyway, so if you were to measure such a thing, you would really want to measure two two attributes of it. The first would be its dispersion to see if it's gapless. And then you'd like to measure its integrated intensity as a function of Q to see if it satisfies the F sum rule. 
that's the that's the true test to see if the thing is actually neutral. Okay, everybody with me so far? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, let's talk about strontium rufinate. So this is a layered perovskite. It has the same structure, cr crystal structure as some of the high temperature superconductors, um, but it's got ruthenium instead of copper. So it's um, 4D electrons instead of 3D electrons. So uh, it has actually three Fermi surfaces, not two. So it has three different species of electrons, not two. The three different Fermi surfaces are called alpha, beta, and gamma. And they're tied to the three different T2G electrons of the ruthenium. So what can we say about strontium ruthenate? It, at low temperature, at, at energy scales below a few hundred Kelvin, it's really an excellent Fermi liquid. It has very nice quantum oscillations. Um, it has T-squared resistivity. It sort of does everything that uh, you'd like a metal to do. Um, has rather low um, disorder levels as characterized by residual resistance ratios and so on. And because it has three different Fermi surfaces, I think we'd have to agree it's a candidate demon material. Now, it's not as simple as the situation that Pines addressed where he just had two Fermi surfaces. Um, but nevertheless, you'd have to agree it has the capacity to exhibit a demon if it wanted to. But to know for sure, you'd have to do a measurement. And crucially, you'd have to do some kind of microscopic calculation so you could understand if a demon might be expected in a material like this. OK, so um, if you look from the side at the band, so the beta band, um, there you see some things that are intriguing. So the beta band, so this is now energy momentum from ARPES. And you can see the beta and the gamma bands in particular have very different Fermi velocities. So there's a little bit of a hint here that, the, that these two bands might act a little bit like heavy electrons and light electrons in the sense that Pines originally um, conceptualized. So just as a bit of foreshadowing. OK, so um, good. So let's talk about the experiment. So uh, the experiment is EEL. So this is electron. Uh, uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy. It's inelastic electron scattering. It's very much like the experiments Peng Cheng does with neutrons, um, but we use electrons instead. Uh, the M in front is a thing we add to emphasize the fact that we did a lot of work to make this technique momentum resolved. So um, the instrument, this is what it looks like. It's basically um, a, a double mu metal shielded ultra high vacuum system. So the whole eel system is inside this one tank. Uh, we run at a pressure of about 10 to the minus 11. So we pump this thing with cryo pump, with a cryo pump and some liquid nitrogen cooled uh, titanium sublimation pump. And uh, there's a prep chamber um, that's a somewhat surface sensitive technique. I'll have a, we can talk about what that means too, um, if you like. But anyway, normally we prepare surfaces by cleaving them. And this is a fast entry load lock here. So the experiments are a lot like photomission experiments while you're doing them. We use similar sample holders, same kind of cryostats, um, same kinds of glues, and, and so on. So um, the energy resolution of the instrument is about 6 milli EV. So it's similar to what you would get from some triple axis spectrometer at HIFER or so on. Um, and we have, uh, and the key thing about, the, about M eels as opposed to regular eels is we can achieve both high res momentum resolution and high momentum accuracy. So momentum resolution is about to a 0.02 inverse angstrom, which is a few percent of a Brillouin zone of the typical material. And then the, we can separately specify the momentum accuracy. Um, that means so that so momentum resolution tells you how big a region of momentum space you're integrating over. Momentum accuracy tell, tells you accuracy tells you how accurately you can position that in momentum space. So um, here's a cartoon of how it works. I spent a whole weekend computing this. Basically, you shoot an electron at a surface. And then it scatters and it makes a collective mode. And you can measure the properties of the collective mode by studying the scatter electron, its energy and momentum dependence. Uh, there are very good theories for what this technique measures. They were originally worked out by a spectroscopist, a theorist at UC Irvine named Doug Mills. Um, but basically what it measures is the density density correlation function of the surface of the material. So the differential cross section is some constants times some matrix elements times S of Q and omega. S of Q and omega satisfies the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So S is the Bose factor times chi double prime. This is the density response function of the surface. 
So what, what is what is the penetration depth? Like one layer or how many? Good. Layers? I was hoping you were going to ask. So <laughs> I did. <laughs> the, yeah. the probe depth. So this it's I called it a surface technique, but it's not really surface. So the probe depth is um, basically given by the inverse of the in-plane momentum transfer. So if you measure at 0.05, um, a Q of 0.05 reciprocal lattice units, then you probe the inverse of that in lattice parameters into the material, which would be uh, 20 lattice parameters. Mm. So it's actually, a, it's a bulk technique. It measures the bulk excitations of the system, but it does so through the surface. So I think the way I, I normally describe it as it's a it's a bulk probe of the excitations of a semi-infinite system. Mm. Okay, so the fact that a surface is present is important, especially when long-range coulomb is involved. But you probe quite far into the material, so you see bulk excitations with the technique. But I thought I thought um, strong conclusion has surface reconstruction, right? Does that affect? Mm. A yes, I have a whole set of slides on that. I was assuming no one would know. <laughs> um, there, there are two reconstructions. There's a structural one where the octahedral rotate. Mm -hmm. And then there's actually a surface state band that comes when you break the ruthenium oxygen, apical oxygen bonds. Mm -hmm. And then there's an actual surface state there. And that could itself has a, have a plasmon, a, a, a 2D plasmon. So um, we actually got rid of that the way. So there, this is, OK, we're getting into the weeds. Should I save this till the end or do it now? OK, OK, whatever you want to do. <laughs> Um, uh, there is a there is a surface state that that um, the way you get rid of it is by exposing the surface to carbon monoxide. Mm. Uh, this was in a paper by um, the St. Andrews group. Actually, this is the paper here. So if you take the surface and then you cleave in UHV exposed to CO, then you get Fermi surface bands that look like this and you really get bulk measurements out of the surface technique. But uh, it's important to do that properly. And that's all that's in our paper. But it's it's an excellent question. Yeah, so you have to get rid of that surface state to really get to what the properties of the bulk are doing, and that's true whether you're doing photo emission or STM or eels or anything. Um, okay, so where was I leaving off? Oh yeah, so we measure a bulk, we measure a density response, and if this is Q independent, then this is actually proportional to the imaginary part of one over one plus epsilon, where this epsilon is the bulk dielectric function. So it's a bulk probe of the collective excitations of the system, though you have to be careful how you interpret it because we're doing measurements through a surface and the surface matters. Okay, um, good. So, um, what, so let's suppose we, what would you expect to see? Let's suppose we just guessed ahead of time, what, what would we think we'd see in a measurement? So, you ex so strontium ruthenate's a metal, it's a good metal, so you expect it to have a plasmon. So where do plasmons appear? In general, they appear where the real part of the dielectric function crosses zero. Um, so in strontium ruthenate, that happens at about 1.5 eV. So you might expect to see a peak at one and a half eV. Um, and you do. So this is some wide, wide energy range measurements. So on the vertical is just the susceptibility, the eels response, whatever it is. Um, and then um, as a function of energy for a selection of momenta, and I'm gonna mute my phone, sorry. And you can see some things that are interesting. So the, lo the lowest momentum here is 0.02. So this is in reciprocal lattice units. So this is in units of inverse lattice parameters. So if you take one over this number, that's the wavelength in, in lattice parameters. And what you can see is there is a peak. And it is at around one and a half EV. Um, so that's the conventional plasmon. And it's really not a very good plasmon, let's be honest. It's not nice and sharp at all. It's very broad, but it's there. And um, the fact that it's present is means you suggest the measurement works. Uh, if you measure the Q dependence of that, it actually evolves into something that looks more like a continuum. And that actually has to do with some strange metal physics that I'm not going to talk about in this paper, but it's discussed in uh, some other papers that we've written. We can come back to this if anybody's interested in strange metals. But, the, but I think the bottom line is at high energy, there is a plasmon, but it's very damped. And the physics of the system at high energy scales is, um, can be quite complicated. And I think I already alluded to that from references to the fact that it's a bad metal at high temperature and so on. So the thing that we're interested in in this um, study is the low energy part. So this is the same measurements now at much lower momenta and much lower energy. So this 
So this is starting at Q equals 0, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0.04, the highest momentum here is 0.1. So that's the inverse of 10 lattice parameters. And this is a function of energy loss. And this is um, 100 MeV full scale. So this is down in the milli EV range. So up at 65 MeV, there's a phonon. That's a well-known thing. It's seen with infrared and, and Raman techniques. Actually, infrared. Um, so fine. And then and if you look, there's another mode. So let's just focus on the red for the moment. That's room temperature. So you can see at low Q, you don't really see it. But as you increase momenta, it appears and it disperses outward. And then at some momenta above about 0.08, it collides with this phonon and then disappears. So there is a collective, another collective mode in there. It's sharp, but not as sharp as a phonon. It's extremely dispersive. And as far as we can tell, it's gapless. And the dispersion curve is temperature dependent. I'll discuss that a little bit at the end. Um, but the main thing is it does look like there's another mode there and it's a gapless mode. So this is one of those cases where it's useful to look on a color plot. Um, and this is what it looks like. So this is just the same data. So this is momentum on this axis, energy on this axis. And this is this mode. And um, its dispersion over most of its range is roughly linear. Though at very low momentum, it kind of bends over and becomes Q squared. And we saw this in 2018 and spent a lot of time trying to understand what it is. Um, is everybody still with me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. From anyone in a long time. The people, people looking at staring at your data. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so these error bars. There's a lot of thought that went into them. These are really these error. They're they're given by both the experimental resolution and the statistical quality of the data. And so what, um, where's the zone boundary expected to be? It's at 0.5. Oh, so this is extremely small. Q, it's then. very small momenta. At momenta bigger than 0.08, you don't see this thing. Um, its width is Q dependent. It actually goes like, the width goes like Q squared. And at energies above, at momenta bigger than about 0.08, the width is bigger than the energy and it's over damped. So acoustic and, phonons are much lower in energy, right? I mean, this cannot be yeah, acoustic. Yeah, let's, let's, so let's just do that. Okay, so what could this mode be? So there's some mundane things that um, we should consider first. The first is exactly what you just said, acoustic phonons. Okay, those are gapless modes. So the key thing is this thing is way too fast to be an acoustic phonon. So acoustic phonons propagate at the sound velocity. So this thing, H bar V is around a half an EV angstrom. But the acoustic phonons, that number is about 0 0.008. So it's two orders of magnitude fast, mm -hmm. too fast to be, an, to be an acoustic phonon. In other words, it propagates 100 times faster than the sound velocity. So it's got to be something electronic. So you might wonder, could it just be a surface plasmon? Now, there's different kinds of surface plasmons. So you could have a surface plasmon because there's a 2D surface state that hasn't been passivated. And that's really a 2DEG that has a collective mode. That's one way to get a surface plasmon. Another one is to have a semi-infinite metal with a surface mode. It's a different kind of plasmon. So we have to consider both of those possibilities. The second one I already talked about because you brought it up. There is a surface state band in this material. And the way you get rid of it is you passivate it with CO. Um, and that's been well studied. There's se several papers on how to do that. And so our surfaces are fully passivated. So that thing is not present. Could it be a surface plasmon? It turns out surface plasmons are also are actually too fast. So um, uh, a surface plasmon is only gapless because at very low momenta, it becomes a polariton. It mixes with a photon. So the gapless dispersive region of a surface plasmon actually propagates at the speed of light. And that velocity is far too fast to be the excitation that we see. So that's something like a thousand times um, faster. So um, I could get more into, into this in more detail, but it's, it's uh, not possible to explain this excitation from any of these mundane things. And I'm not aware of a fourth way to get a gapless mode in a solid. That's a charge mode. Of course, you can get gapless spin waves and a ferromagnet magnet or something, but um, we're measuring charge excitations, not spin excitations. So you really have to start looking at alternative explanations. So the main one is, could this thing be a demon? because it does have multiple Fermi surfaces and you would expect such an excitation to uh, be present. So the only way to know for sure is to do a microscopic calculation. So um, Edwin Huang who's a postdoc here 
at ICMT did an RPA calculation of strontium ruthenate. And um, this is, it wasn't an easy thing to do, but it was straightforward. So we used the known band structure, which was parameterized by uh, Sergei Borisenko's group in um, Germany. And so these are what the alpha, beta, gamma bands look like. And we basically compute the Lindhard function, just the single bubble, and then do the random phase approximation, chi naught over one minus V chi naught to get chi RPA. V here is just the Coulomb interaction, E squared over epsilon uh, Q squared. And for epsilon naught, we used four and a half, which is the background dielectric constant that people uh, use from optics. So there are no adjustable parameters in this. You simply plug in the known band structure with the known background epsilon and compute it and see what you get. And then it might agree and it might not. So um, when we first did this, we were a little bit disappointed because we th thought it didn't work. So this, so, so let me just show you what this is. So this is plots of chi double prime, that density response function as a function of omega and Q. And the key thing, and I said this earlier, chi double prime actually goes to zero as Q goes to zero. It goes to zero like Q squared because of the F sum rule. So it's much more useful to plot chi double prime over Q squared because then at, at Q, zero Q that goes to a constant. So what do you see? At high energy, you see a plasmon. So that's the one EV, that's the high energy conventional plasmon that I already showed you. Um, just going back, that is this thing, okay? And um, you can see some things that are useful. Um, RPA does a pretty decent job predicting the existence of this mode. And it does a decent job predicting its energy, though it does not get the width at all. That's because there's a lot of physics left out of RPA. It doesn't have local field factors. It doesn't have vertex corrections. There's a whole bunch of stuff missing. But it does an okay job. It'll tell you how many modes there are and roughly where they are. So it's uh, you know useful, I would say. At any rate, so there's a conventional plasma. By the way, this downward dispersion is a band structure effect. And that's a thing that's known to happen in other materials, like particularly transition metal dichalcogenides uh, do that. So that's an interesting effect. Um, if you look down in the low energy regime to see if there's a gapless mode, you don't see anything. So we were a little bit disappointed at first because we thought, oh crud, we hoped this thing would have a demon, but it doesn't. But if you look closely, let's suppose you just zoom in the color scale, okay? So I'm just expanding the color scale now. Actually, there is a mode there and it is gapless and it disperses linearly, but it vanishes as you go to zero. And if you think about it for a few seconds, now it becomes obvious why, because don't forget a demon is neutral. Now conventional plasmons, the intensity goes to zero like Q squared because they satisfy this F sum rule. But demons don't do that. Demons are neutral. They go to zero with a power law that's higher than Q squared. That's the definition of being neutral in the sense that Pines meant it. Okay, so if you take the data, this chi, and instead divide by Q to the fourth, then you see a nice mode, okay? But the mode isn't going to zero like Q squared, like a regular mode would. It's going to zero like Q to the fourth because it's actually something that's neutral. And it's dispersing linearly, which is roughly what the experiment shows and is what Pines predicted. Okay, so how much time do I have? I, do I get the whole hour or is it 50 minutes? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah you can, uh, yeah, you can, you can, you can talk, yeah. Um, okay, so let me just, so um, to, to be absolutely sure it was a demon, Edwin came up with some clever approach. What he did is he did a band projected uh, uh, RPA calculation. So instead, so this chi here is just the, the defined in terms of the total charge. What he did is he said, let's define a new quantity. I'll call it chi AADD. And what this is, is a, a statement of how electrons in band A respond if I drive the system with a potential that couples only to electrons in band D. I'm not sure if this makes any sense. If I were there in person, I could see if people were nodding or not. But it's a physically, I don't know how you'd ever measure such a thing, but mathematically, you can write down such a thing. You write a potential that only couples to the gamma electrons and then see how the beta electrons respond. That's something that can be computed in RPA. And if you do that, you can show beyond any doubt that this mode in RPA is a demon. So forget about the experiment for a moment. This is just a statement about RPA. So if you mm -hmm. look at all these different, so this thing's now a matrix with the alpha, beta, and gamma electrons in it. 
And you can see that no matter where you look, if you talk about the conventional plasmon, this thing is always the same because for the conventional plasmon, everything's moving in phase, charge is charge. It doesn't, the alpha electrons don't care if you're driving it with a potential that couples to the gamma electrons or the alpha electrons because charge is charge. It doesn't make any difference. So you can excite this thing no matter how you drive it. If you look at the gapless mode though, things are different. So if I look at the gamma gamma channel or the beta beta channel, then I can see this mode in both of those channels and it has the same sign. But if we look at the off diagonal channels, so this would be where I drive the beta electrons and look at how the gammas respond. These things have the opposite sign. And that's really the sort of, from the RPA point of view, a smoking gun. It means if I drive the system, if I drive the beta electrons, the gamma electrons respond 180 degrees out of phase from the way they would respond if I drove the gamma electrons themselves. And that means this collective mode is really an out of phase mode of those two subbands. It's not a simple con collective mode. So this thing is a demon, okay? It's an out of phase excitation. It's neutral, it goes to zero, it violates this F sum rule and all that. So there's no question that in the calculation, there's a demon, which means you expect a demon to exist in, in uh, strontium ruthenate. And from very from, important, this, yeah, did you want to say something? Yeah, from which band to which band? Gamma beta. Gamma beta, okay, thank you. And those are the ones that had rather different Fermi velocities. Okay. So you, cut, you probably should ask at some point, why don't I get one involving the alpha band? And actually, I think you do, but let's come back to that at the end. But this mode is pretty much just the gamma and the beta uh, electrons beating against one another. Um, okay, so let's compare to the experiment. So on this plot is the dispersion of the mode at room temperature. That's where it goes to the highest energy and the uh, RPA dispersion. So you notice a few things. The first thing is the RPA is not exactly linear. It has a little bit of a dimple in it. And that's just because, what can I say? Strontium ruthenate's a real material. The Fermi velocity is anisotropic. It's, it's, Q dependent, it's K dependent and so on. So if you put in all those effects, it actually isn't perfectly linear, but it is gapless. And, it, and you can put a velocity on it with some error bars. Um, the main thing is the velocity is within 10% of the velocity of the experiment. So if you try to explain this mode in terms of acoustic phonons or surface plasmons, the velocity is off by factors of 100 to 1,000, but the demon's within 10%. So it really, it's really close, um, much closer than RPA has a right to be. Though one discrepancy is we do see a, a Q squared region down here at low momentum. We spent a lot of time trying to assess whether we believe that if that wasn't just a resolution effect, but it does look like it's real. So this whole dispersion curve, if you extrapolate it, it doesn't go through zero at Q equals zero. It, the whole thing is shifted. And there's a conversation to be had about why that is. And I think it has something to do with the fact that RPA is not exact. It leaves out vertex corrections and hydrodynamic effects that I think really can become important at small momentum. We can discuss that at the end. At any rate, um, it really looks like it. it uh, it's, it's that. Okay, but the real test is, well, at least I think that's already a real test. It's really hard to get a neutral charge excitation in three dimensions. It's, it's really hard to get a gapless charge excitations in three dimensions, but it's important to check the sum rule. So um, this is now gonna get a little bit technical and if everybody checks out for a minute, that's okay. Um, but we really have to compare the integrated intensity of this thing to what's expected from the F sum rule. So now we got to get into the weeds a little bit and recognize that the um, eels measures, the surface eels measures a response function, but it's not the same response function as what you compute in RPA. So the sum rule it satisfies isn't just a simple integral as is first moment integral is the density times Q squared. The actual sum rule is this. So this was derived by Bruno Uchoa at the University of Oklahoma. It's not published prior to this study. It's in the supplement of our paper, but this is the sum rule. So this is, and this isn't a sum rule on the susceptibility. We kept things simple. This is the sum rule on the eels cross section, okay? And it's at finite temperature. And basically the integrated intensity, the inter integral of the differential scattering cross section is these matrix elements and then just an integral over the surface density. 
So if you assume this is a step function, which is a good approximation at small momentum, and you assume that the, yield, that the mode dispersion is Q squared, which is what it actually is in the long wavelength limit, what you predict from the sum rule is that I naught should go like one over Q to the fifth. I naught being the integrated intensity of the whatever the gapless mode is. So now what does this mean? It means that if I have a conventional collective mode, a conventional plasmon, and by conventional, I mean it satisfies the F sum rule because it corresponds to all the excitations of some well-defined sector of the, of the system, then it should go like one over Q to the fifth if it has this dispersion. So what we can do is then measure the intensity of this thing, put a power law on it, and see if this power law is greater than minus five or if it's not. If it's minus five, then it's a null result. It means it's just a regular mode that for some reason we can't measure. The, it's actually probably gapped and we just can't measure it for some reason. If it's faster than this, meaning alpha is bigger than minus five, then it's neutral. Neutral in the sense that it doesn't contribute to epsilon because it's a neutral mode. So here's the result. So this is log momentum transfer on this axis log intensity on that axis. So if it's a power law, it should be a line. One over Q to the fifth is the dashed line, this gray one. What the actual experiment does is this. It's not a perfect power law. There's no reason to expect it to be exactly a power law, but it's something like Q to the minus 1.8. So minus 1.8 is greater than minus five, um, meaning that the thing isn't, is, is actually neutral in the sense of not following the Q dependence predicted by the sum rule. So there's more to be discussed there, but I'll leave it at that. Um, so in summary, we saw a gapless mode in strontium ruthenate, stared at it for three years and finally figured out that it's a demon. Um, a demon is an excitation that was predicted 66 years ago and appears not to have been measured before. And if you'd like to ask why, um, that's a whole conversation, but the main reason is it's neutral. So they don't couple to light. It, it doesn't contribute to epsilon. So you have to do some finite wave vector measurement to see the thing. And what is it? It really is a modulation in the band occupancy. So a plasmon is a modulation in the total density of the system. A demon is a modulation in sort of the band index, right? When So you might imagine the beta band has a modulation, the gamma band has a modulation. Those things are 180 degrees out of phase. So the total density is undisturbed but you're moving charge in between the two bands and that doesn't have a Coulomb cost to it. So that thing can have zero energy at zero Q. So in a way it's a little bit like a spin wave. You know, spin waves can be gapless too um, because there what's being modulated isn't a charge density, it's a spin index. So here what's modulated is the band index. So it's something closer to a magnon than a plasmon though it really is still total particle number and not you know, it's, it's all scalar excitations or any, any actual spin involved. Um, so uh, if you'd like to read more, it's on the archive, out for review, and um, I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks a lot. Yes, thank you very much, yeah, Peter. Yeah, let, me, let, me, let me ask you a, a, sort of a, a question. People know these uh, sort of a, a strong solution at all for the band. If you, if you squash it in one direction, you, yeah. you have, you know, Van Hoof singularities and all the bands changes, right? Yes. I mean, one, I mean, so, so, you, you'd expect then, based on your picture, then such a mode would, would, you know, would move, right? Absolutely, it should respond enormously to strain. Yeah, so, so have you done that? Or? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, in, in our defense, um, well, we haven't even published this yet, so we haven't worked on the success for <laughs> experiment. Sure, it, sure, it, sure, it's sure. actually possible, so um, we don't have, so we can't do hydrostatic pressure for obvious reasons, you can't get the beam in and out, but uniaxial pressure is no, possible. No, uniaxial pressure. Right? People, people have shown uniaxial pressure can really yeah. tune TC and so, so on, um, right? So, what, so what, we, what we would have to do is build a custom sample stage, put one of these Clifford Hicks kind of cells on it, and then apply strain. And um, there's a bunch of issues of stray fields and things we'd have to straighten out. Um, yeah, yeah, I think if, the, if Ali gets a faculty job, that'd be a great assistant professor proposal for him. Mm -hmm. So can, can you go back to your data? I have another question, you know, concerning your data. Uh, which yeah. one? This one? Uh, no, no, the, the raw data. Oh, the, the line, line plots? Yeah, line plot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so look at, I mean, I, I see another feature, right? Uh, roughly, you know, the for Q equal to zero at the, 
say here. Yeah, what is that? Um, I don't know. A little. Uh, there are some other phonons and things down here. Okay. It's not the okay. only mode that's in the system. I'm not. That's it's. Yeah, not exactly sure. Okay. Okay. No, I was just curious. Yeah, because I mean, you, I guess your resolution is six. And people always argue that can you have better resolution? You know, to really see. I mean, then in the end, you said that it become quadratic, right? A low Q. Yeah, I mean, dispersion. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 it become quadratic. Then, so I mean, you, you, you made some uh, reasoning for that. Can you, can you spell out some more? I mean, what, what is? The oh, why is it quadratic? Yeah, yeah. Why is it quadratic a lower Q? Okay. I, I, I thought I, I thought the Davis uh, David Pine's picture was it should be linear, right? A low Q. Yeah. Well, his he has a very, yeah. So he his art his he doesn't have a quantitative theory. It's very heuristic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um. Okay. I don't. The short answer is I don't know. But let me give you some guesses. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first guess is to recognize RPA is not an exact theory. It's missing many, many things. Sure, sure, sure. So, so, um, and actually what Pines did was RPA too. He invented RPA, <laughs> okay? okay? So the linearity comes out of RPA. So maybe the question is, when is RPA not valid? Mm -hmm. um, one, it, it, it's, it's, it leaves out several things. It, um, the first thing it leaves out is any kind of, of hydrodynamic effects. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the in the very long wavelength, you know, this this at 0 0.01, that's the inverse of 100 lattice parameters. Right, right. At that scale, there's really no reason to think that I just have simple non-interacting electrons or that are interacting only through long-ranged coulomb. There's a whole bunch of other many body physics that kicks in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and if you look when when do hydrodynamic effects become important? They become important when um, Q is very small and omega is very small. So it's right down in this region where you expect there to be big corrections. Okay. So that's sort of a, I, I think you'd have to do, so there's a, there's a theorist at, uh, um, named Felix Flicker, who you may not know, a young guy who's actually gone and done sort of a, a, the next correction beyond RPA, putting in some GW correction. Mm -hmm. And he actually finds that the whole dispersion curve shifts in this way. I see, I see. So it could be a many body effect. Uh, let me give an experimentalist answer. It could also simply be disorder. You know, if I have a system of collective modes and I put disorder in, it can pin those collective modes at finite frequency. We know this from charge density waves, right? You can put disorder in a CDW system and you can actually pin the CDW fluctuations. Mm -hmm. Pinning means taking a collective mode and driving it to zero at finite frequency. I'm sorry, at finite momentum. So you drive it to zero frequency at finite momentum. So yeah, that's, but, but, that's but, what but pinning is. The two and four is hard to believe. Right? Two and four is supposed to be the purest of the pure material. It right? is, but nothing's perfect. <laughs> of course, I agree. <laughs> yeah. So um, okay. any disorder effect, I would think it would do this. I see. I see. But yeah, I don't. But I think some combination of those two things is probably what's going on. Okay. But discrepancies between RPA and experiment are not unexpected because it's not an exact theory. And certainly for the high energy plasma, the agreement's even worse. Okay. Uh, how low in temperature can you can you use your technique uh, without running it? Can you get into the superconducting state and to see how any of these things evolve? It's not fine. even close. So right now, so we so the, these measurements, the lowest is twenty Kelvin. We have a prototype ten Kelvin sample stage that we're about to roll out and start doing measurements this fall. I hope. TC of this material is one and a half Kelvin. Yeah, so we're still an order of magnitude away. It's really but, hard to do spectroscopy below TC. But, but, but Peter, I mean, so, so use is actually, I mean, it's a strong coupling I mean, because the electron, you know, traveling is a strong coupling probe. It's not a weak coupling probe, right? So, so yeah, how, yeah. How, how, how does that affect, you know, potentially sort of these results? Because, um, the, I mean, the interaction between electrons and, and the electrons in the sample. Yeah. So this is, a, this is a basic eels question. So this really comes down to, yeah. Um, okay, I'll give, you a, I'll give you a short answer and then we can have a longer discussion if you want. For eels, multiple scattering is a massive effect. Right. Um, for low energy electrons, so our electron kinetic energy is typically 50 EV. Mm -hmm. The multiple scattering occurs overwhelmingly in the elastic channel. So meaning the electron comes in it diffracts many, many times 
scatters inelastically once and then departs the sample. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in that particular limit, and this was written by these papers by Doug Mills, he spent a big part of his career on this. Um, um, the, so there's a in that limit, there's an approximation that works very well, which is called the distorted wave born approximation. Mm -hmm. And I know there's neutron people who do this too. So this whole expression and these matrix elements come out of the distorted wave born approximation. And basically what you do is you say, okay, I don't have a plane wave in and a plane wave out. What I have is a plane wave reflecting off the surface with some reflection coefficient, and that's my incident wave. And then the final state is another combination of incident and an outgoing wave. And I'm really doing scattering, not with plane waves, but with this combined incident and then reflection. So if you look in the sigma naught, the reflectivity of the surface is in there. So that all goes into the derivation of the cross section. And that's why this is a surface response and not just the bulk 3D chi that you compute with um, RPA. And it's also the reason why we had to examine a different sum rule. <coughs> so um, what can I say? It's a pretty validated method. It's been around for half a century, a lot of measurements. It seems to work pretty well describing the data. Okay. So, but, so there's, yeah. a question, there's, yeah. there's a question online saying that, uh, you know, could you, could you compare this uh, demo mode with the early observation of acoustic plasma? By light scattering of optically excited electron hole plasma in Galileo. Yes. Plasma. Yes. Okay. Oh, That's wow. the closest. So if you ask, has anybody ever measured measured a demon before? The closest measurement is exactly what was just described. So there was a paper in the 80s by Aaron Pinzik at Bell Labs. That's mm -hmm. the guy who did Raman on gallium arsenide 2 deg, saw the roton excitations and the edge states and so on. And he did an experiment where he optically excited gallium arsenide and um, made two different sub baths of, of electrons in a transient way. Mm -hmm. And then he did Raman and he saw mode and argued that it might be this demon. But it was sort of a transient thing and it was only in these gallium arsenide quantum wells. And there's some suspicious stuff because a demon's supposed to be at zero frequency and his wasn't. So there was some discussion about is the magnitude of Q in those measurements big enough it was really one paper. So um, if you look in our manuscript, we actually cite that paper. I see, I see. So I think you have, could have a case that maybe somebody saw it transiently in some quantum wells in the 80s. But this is the first measurement in a real stable 3D system in the way, in the sense that Pine, Pine's analyzed in his paper. Do you have any speculation on this? May have anything to do with uh, superconductivity? Or, or oh, I'm or glad you asked. Marvin Cohen. <laughs> Marvin Cohen had a paper uh, in the 80s mm -hmm. where he says the demons could mediate superconductivity, and um, it's a pretty, it's a really very, it's a nice, really nice readable paper. And he argues that they, because demons, they have, they couple to electrons very strongly, especially at finite Q. And he argues that they are they could be a sort of non-phonon mechanism for mediating superconductivity because they're low energy, like phonons, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, and that paper has a lot of citations. And and actually, the most recent study I've seen on that, um, Patrick Lee had a paper recently on bismuth because it was discovered recently that simple bismuth is superconducting if you make it cold enough. And he did an analysis to see if the, and bismuth, bismuth should theoretically have a demon excitation. And he did some analysis to see if the demon might be what's mediating superconductivity in bismuth and concluded that it's not. I don't know if the, the conclusions are that convincing, but there's an interesting question. Could the demon be what drives superconductivity in strontium ruthenate? It might be. And maybe that's got something to do with why it's been so hard to figure out, you know, what the pairing symmetry is and why mm -hmm. the thing is, you know, where superconductivity comes from. So, so Christian Bernhardt has another question. So this material is strongly anisotropic. Yeah. Does your, does your mode the intensity depend on the angle of incident yes. uh, electron beam? Uh, oh, the angle of incidence or, or the direction of the momentum transfer? I guess uh, he's asking the... Uh, the dispersion depend on the angle of incidence of the electron beam. I mean, the way we met, the way we change Q is by changing the angle. So I that's guess, how we change the momentum transfer. 
Oh, you, you just rotate the sample, right? With respect yeah, to, the, to yeah. the beam. Uh, we rotate the sample and the analyzer in conjunction to keep Q per Q per <laughs> fixed and change Q parallel. So it, it changes when you rotate the crystal and that's how we get the dispersion. I think a better question is if we rotate the rotate the direction of Q in the plane, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. does it change? And it does. So this thing, I think I have a plot on that. Maybe I'm answering a question he didn't ask, but so this is the width as a function of Q. If you look at the anisotropy, so this blue is 30 Kelvin along one zero. And you don't want to look at that. Look at red and green. So red is 300 Kelvin one zero. Green is along the one one. It's a little bit different. It's a small amount of difference in dispersion. It's not huge, but it does know about the anisotropy of the Fermi surface a little bit. Do you have a pure along c-axis? You don't, right? Well, Q isn't conserved in the c direction sure, sure, because sure. it's a semi-infinite system. Mm -hmm. So QZ is actually a good, here's a good question. What is QZ? It's zero plus or minus some number that's given by the inverse of the in-plane Q. So um, yeah, we sort of are stuck measuring a QZ equals zero with some um, accuracy is determined by how large we go in Q. So, so if it really occurs a gamma point, if, if you transmit it, you transform by one lattice parameter, can you just have an implant, you know, momentum transfer equal to a, a, a black peak width? I mean, do you, do you see this repeating? Just you mean like if we the, go to the second zone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we didn't do that, but every material we've ever studied, you see copies in the next Brillouin zone of what's happening around the gamma point. So I would expect if we went to one zero, we would see it out there too. But you're quite confident of that, yeah. Uh, we didn't do it, but everything we've ever looked at, it does that. So I would expect that, but um, didn't confirm it. Okay. Are there any other questions for, for Peter? I mean, it's a very, very interesting talk. It's really, I think there's going to be a lot of follow-up study trying to understand this, yeah. Particularly yeah. If that have anything to do with superconductivity, it would be really exciting, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, <laughs> okay, actually, well, let me answer. I have some, I have another, people could be leaving, but there are, there are reasons to think that demons should exist in all multiband metals, mm -hmm. right? Uh, iron arsenide, superconductors, anything with more than one band, there should be a mode down there. We just didn't see it because we haven't done eels. So, can, can we, is there any other technique that can see this besides besides you guys' technique? I mean, because you, you I, I know you have a unique instrument, right? I mean, the stuff you can do, very few other people can do. Can, yeah. can Rix, for example, see this thing as well? Rix, if they had good enough resolution, yeah, I think so. I mean, modern Rix, you know, you can you can have a resolution, you know, about 10 metabol, right? Um, I think the best I've seen is 30. Oh, I thought I thought the ones that was the Brookhaven, you know, six. I mean, like maybe there's, 10, yeah, six is is talking about yeah, yeah 10, 10, 10, 10, 15, yeah. I mean, the whole dispersion curve stops at sixty. Yeah, so, so conventional. You know, Rick's if tough, yeah. I, uh, Rick's instruments for sure, they've had they have their production instruments with thirty MeV. Mm -hmm. Those are not good enough. So you'd have to do better than that. But I think in principle, the the Rick should see it. And they have much better momentum resolution than we do. So I would think they would have no problem with the Q. So STM, STM would have no chance, right? Well, STM doesn't measure a two particle response. It sure, measures sure, sure, sure. single single particle, yeah. Same with photometry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, neutrons, no neutrons no measures two particle response. <laughs> well, it doesn't, 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 neutron has no charge. So we don't <laughs> see charge. Neutrons are neutral. <laughs> we don't see charge, yeah. If, yeah. if neutrons had charge, then you guys would have seen this thing yeah, in the 50s, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, we see phonons, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. very interesting talk, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. And any other question? Yeah, uh, Tomo. No, no, but it was very nice. I really liked it. So thank you very much for all this pedagogy. And uh, yeah, just very general question is that uh, the six millivolt energy resolution is extremely sort of attractive for general sort of inelastic charge measurement. Yeah. So how, how much has been this has been applied to to cuprets? especially the uh, resonance mode and or rather this inelastic things. A, a lot. Well, we have two cuprate papers that were secretly published the last couple of years. <laughs> I um, see. So we, we, should, we should schedule another talk for you to talk about cuprates. Yeah, um, I'll tell you what happens in cuprates is you see this, 
you know, there was this thing called the marginal Fermi liquid phenomenology in the late mm -hmm. 1980s, early 90s, which was conjectures of what the density response should look like in cuprates. And it looks a lot like that. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a whole, that's another whole topic. I see. Okay, so maybe next semester, I'm, you know, yeah, this, just, uh, this series on. is organized by uh, at Columbia in the uh, spring and uh, thrice in the fall. So maybe next spring, I'll invite you for the Cupid talk in the Columbia series. Yeah, great. Yeah, I'll come in person. I'm tired of Zoom, so <laughs> just tell, me, tell okay. me where to go. Texas, okay. New York, I don't care. I'll, I'll, I'll invite you to come to, 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 to Texas to give a talk, an in-person talk. <laughs> Sounds yeah. great. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you guys, yeah. All right, thank you. Guys. Thank you very much. Thanks. Very nice talk. Bye. Yeah.